So the assignment for today was Kindness, Clarity, and Insight, pages 118 to 156. Just so I don't forget, the assignment for next time is in the packet. It's pages 1 through 26. And then the tantric distinction 15 through 79. Now, it'll take us, I assume, the next two times to, to cover this material. The material, uh, well, after that, we'll just be going on in this, in this text, the tantric mode of meditation. So the three principal aspects of the path and the beings of the three capacities. What are the three divisions of the small? Small. Small. Then? You're getting duller. And? Right. So from among the three principal aspects of the path, what are needed in order to become a being of the small of the small? Hmm? Be concerned with more of the things in this life only? Yes, so what among the three principal aspects of the path do you need in order to become a being of the small of the small capacity? None. So even, what about a bugs and snakes and you name them, they're all beings of the smallest, small capacity. Persons of the smallest, small capacity. That's an important perspective when, when one's self gets categorized in the same group. <laughs> You know, if it was a parrot, you might say, well, at least the parrot has quite a bit of intelligence. So what about to become a being of middle incapacity? motivation is right within this lifetime. So the among the three principal aspects of the path, none of them get it again. What about a human rebirth? Would that be necessary for religious practice? Yeah. Now when you're concerned about getting a human rebirth, when that's your main concern, what level have you reached? I'm just writing these down. Um, now, great and small. And this is the dividing line of religious practice according to Atisha, right? So do you need the thought definitely to get out of cyclic existence in order to mainly be concentrated on getting a good lifetime in the future? No. This text talks about developing an attitude in which you're mainly concerned with getting out of cyclic existence. It talks about ah, you 
just have this text memorized. What does it talk about? What are the techniques? Revulsion. Mm -hmm. Answer carefully. Impermanence of our present state. In other words, if we're doing well now, that, that's no guarantee that in the future that we will be in the same state. Mm -hmm. Okay, I stand corrected. But I was thinking that wasn't there. So, to what does the middling person of middling capacity seek to do? Leave what? Leave yes, the main thrust of the person's motivation is to leave cyclic existence. It's not a sporadic thought, it's a thought that's uh, deeply embedded by this point in the personality. And so, obviously, what from among the three principal aspects of the path is needed in order to have this level? Yes. So. Now, what, what I was like, getting at earlier is that in order to develop the thought to get out of sickly existence, you have to understand that our situation, you have to understand the structure of cyclic existence. You have to understand that our situation is a matter of cause and effect. And thus, some of the preliminary understandings toward developing an attitude to get out of cyclic existence lead you to become a being of the greater the middling capacity. You want a better lifetime in the future. You, you know, you extend your scope to, to something that's beyond just the current lifetime, right? So it's in the process of training in this attitude that you develop a wish to have a better lifetime to put more emphasis on a better lifetime in the future. I think it's a natural tendency. Once you start training in a longer scope, right? You know, what are you going to do at your retirement? Uh, it's, it's going to be here soon. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and it stinks. What? And it stinks. It stinks. So then, to have the correct view of emptiness in order to have developed the thought definitely to get out of cyclic existence. No. You say Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily. Under what conditions would you have? We're talking about a combination of the third and the first. Are there any conditions under which there would be somebody who, prior to developing the thought definitely to leave cyclical existence, would have to develop the correct view of emptiness? Have to. Now, we're eliminating that all would, but are there any types of people who would have to? Now, what's said? Um, some people hold, well, let's see, there are, uh, they say there are two types of followers. Followers of fact and followers of faith. Uh, 
<laughs> we had a couple people back there who did some reading on this in Tibet. They've heard about this before. Now, powers of faith do things because the guru said, for instance, it's possible to achieve liberation from cyclic existence. And on the basis of that, we'll engage in the various meditations that cause, as you said, revulsion uh, for cyclic existence. And after a long period of time, from the depths of the heart, develop a promise to leave cyclic existence. But followers of fact insist on knowing that it's possible before they will promise to do it. Followers of fact insist on it. Thus, they have to know that enlightenment is possible. And it's said that the only way to know that enlightenment is possible is to, direct the, is to develop the correct view of emptiness. Because then you know that the afflictive emotions that bind you in cyclic existence do not subsist in the nature of the mind. Do not. They do not have a valid foundation, and thus can be removed. So basically, usually what's understood is the emptiness of the mind. That doesn't mean the non-existence of the mind. We'll be making that clear. But in order to, for this type of person to promise to go to Washington, D.C. to testify on Thursday, the person has to know that it's possible to write testimony on the situation with the bench and Lama before going. Unlike myself, who just said, well, of course, I can do anything, and I'll do it. In fact, they were supposed to call me today, and they didn't during my office. Anyway. So now, I bet that there are, you know, you would think that there would be a third category that's a mixture of these two. Because to, to, to make the division so, what would you call it? So what? Stark. Stark. Is, uh, doesn't leave room for uh, people who are confused. <laughs> well, for much of the dynamism of religious life, where you get certain inklings on the basis of inklings proceed, and then, you know, you get discarded and you're inspired by the guru, that sort of situation. But in any case, all this is to point out that for some people, it will be necessary to generate the correct view of emptiness prior to developing the thought to definitely to leave sickly existence. Yes? Is faith another defined as simply doing it as the guru Yeah, this kind of faith. There is a very good question, because uh, among faiths, there's the faith of Kauinteva. Like clarity. This means, you know, like you see a statue, or you see a particular religious figure, and it's like, it clears out the mind. Uh, and it opens the mind to possibilities. It's said to be like a, a certain type of stone that when put in water will cause the silt that's in the water to, to go to the bottom. Then there's the faith that is the wish <coughs> to attain certain qualities. I really want to be compassionate. I'd really like to understand emptiness. And then there's the faith of conviction. Now, f conviction here means valid cognition. And thus, what's <laughs> what she's asking is, are we excluding in followers of faith here followers of valid cognition. Yes, because valid cognition is, is just what the followers of fact require. They require a valid cognition of the emptiness of the mind, a valid cognition that 
enlightenment as possible <coughs> before promising to attain it. <coughs> and followers, you know, there's a, in a scholastic uh, religious system, there's some waiting, I mean, there's some preference for followers of fact. Because in fact, it's stronger. If you realize, really understand emptiness and know that enlightenment is possible, your wish to attain enlightenment is very, very strong and solid. But of course, if you're trying to be a follower of fact and you're constantly beset by doubt, the follower of faith may proceed on much faster than you, right? Then, to become a being of great capacity, what is needed amongst the three? One and two? What did you say? I said one and two. One and two? What else do we have? Two and three. Two and three. Don't need one. So if you have two, that eliminates the need for one. Oh, if you have two, you don't need one. You can have two without having one? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> sure. Why not? Wow. One, two, and then three. One, two, and three. <laughs> okay, one, two, and three. Very good. You said two and three, right? I said one and two. One and two, yes. So three and three, and then you will eventually get the correct view of emptiness. And again, you'd probably say that there are some who have the correct view prior to developing the altruistic intention, fully developing it, right? Just like some who have number three prior to number one. So there'd be some prior to number two. So that's your view. What else? I feel like it's number two, but it's really the original. Number two. So and could you have two without one? Two, is, two may be crucial, but can you have it without one? Well, it seems to me like two he can says no. Two can prior to one that, that you undertake the thought to basic positions because you have this compassion and intention that includes others as well as yourself. Could you really hold a, a, a firmly to an altruistic intention to attain enlightenment without actually being committed to these existence? I mean, it seems they seem at, bound together inextricably. That's what's usually said. That's what's always said. Uh, if you don't understand the, your own plight of cyclic existence in all of its thoroughness, there is no way that you can apply this to other people in all of its thoroughness. It's like having compassion for poor people, but not for rich people. Uh, you know, you wouldn't know the depths of cyclic existence. If you know the depths of cyclic existence and care that much about other people, you certainly will want to get yourself out of cyclic existence. To become a being of great capacity, it's necessary to have the thought definitely to get out of cyclic existence oneself. But one does not stop there one extends this realization to other beings and, and is drawn into mainly seeking that they attain highest enlightenment. Because you see them as close and you know how they're suffering. If you know how someone suffers and they're close, you want to take care of them, you want to help them. If you know that someone suffers and they're not close, <coughs> you could easily be happy, take joy. Oh, so-and-so is finally getting it, right? Hope they get more. <coughs> now, with regard to the question of correct view of emptiness, it's mostly said that most I mean, these are sharper people to begin with. It's the sharper who are the great. 
And so they will tend to be followers of fact. And they won't promise to attain Buddhahood without having understood that Buddhahood is possible, the same process. Now, some Tibetan scholars say all beings of great capacity you know, realize emptiness before generating the altruistic tension to become enlightened. All, as some say some, you know, most. Well, you can see the, their reasoning. Okay? But if you have the correct view, does it make any difference whether you're in or out of cyclic existence? If you have... What difference does it make? The correct view here means that in the progression of <coughs> Let's see. Um, it said we we start in wrong view. That means the the instead of considering phenomena to be empty of inherent existence, we consider them to be inherently existent, to exist from their own side to exist by way of their own nature, to exist by way of their own being. That's a, it's something we naturally, it's how we naturally see things, but it's wrong. And then the next step is doubt. And the first level of doubt is doubt tending to, I don't know, what's wrong? Oh, probably things inherently exist. Then equal doubt. Maybe they inherently exist or not. And then doubt tending to the fact. Oh, probably or maybe things don't inherently exist. This is said to be a very powerful step, this step of doubt. Doubt tending to the fact. It's said to be like as you'll read, uh, first doubting an old friend. You know, it's like sends ripples throughout your being. Then, correct assumption. Which goes stronger than doubt, which goes uh, things do not inherently exist but you don't have incon incontrovertible realization yet. Then the next step, this is a good intro to uh, tomorrow and ne next Tuesday assignment. Next step is inference. Inference is now incontrovertible realization. It is not uh, merely superficially intellectual like because of this, that, you know, so and such is to be concluded, although it, that's the format of it. There, as you will see, there are reasons and there's a conclusion. But the conclusion has to be felt down to the very core of your being, with there being now no possibility, as long as the functioning of that realization lasts, of thinking of yourself or whatever it is as, as inherently existent. That is the level we're talking about when we say generate the correct view of emptiness, inference. That's the meaning here. So that's one thing we have to look into. What is the measure of having generated each of these? The measure of having generated the correct view of emptiness is at bottom inference. <clears throat> yes. Now the person who's a follower of fact and must have a perception of emptiness before they have the thought of leaving cyclical existence, what level are we talking about? Inference. Oh, inference. Yes. Then, above that, is direct perception.
direct perception is a totally non-dual state. It, it said that with inference uh, of emptiness, while that consciousness functions, you could walk through a, a wall. While that consciousness is functioning. That inf inference is not some petty, you know, superficial string together of words. So that your being has been affected profoundly. Then through meditation, and we're going to be discussing a lot how one moves from into inference, the level of inference, and then from inference to direct perception in the, in the course of this course. Then, so you see, having the correct view means being at the level of inference. But that still, we see, even if during the functioning of that consciousness, that period, you wouldn't conceive uh, openly of objects to inherently exist, you haven't really, from the root, gotten rid of any problems. In order to, from the root, get rid of problems, you have to proceed to the level of direct perception. Direct perception once is not sufficient. You then have to engage in direct perception over and over and over again, okay? So then, beyond direct perception, I, uh, we could posit uh, the level of Buddhahood in which you can see both emptiness and phenomena directly at the same time. beginning the study of second year Tibetan, this is the topic, this is the purpose of the initial topic that you're studying, to get straight this progression. There are two more added in here that have no bearing on this process. What they're trying to do is to lay out this process. And then it, even be it becomes a grid that is moved from topic to topic to see where uh, where things fit, and do they fit, or what do you do with this and that? Mm. Yes. We're thinking about uh, reincarnation that took the young years. Do they already have correct view of emptiness? Well, this pension lama. I, I believe he died. I, I've not seen in any of the statements I've been on. Very strange that I haven't so far. But I believe he died in January. He was born in April, either March or April. Uh, so he's like, wow, oh, hey, man, how did he do that? Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's like if you've achieved a certain level, then you could have taken rebirth two years ago, you know? You could take root 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so what were you saying? Well, so yeah, with a reincarnation then, uh, if it's a valid reincarnation, there'd be all sorts. The, in discussion with the Dalai Lama once, he told me the bottom line of being identified as a Tugu, uh, known popularly as Tugu, is that you're, not necessarily that you chose your own rebirth, but that it was motivated by uh, love and compassion to serve others. That that was the, the driving force for your taking rebirth. So thus, you would necessarily know, you know, be through clairvoyant means. Uh, he apparently, uh, through dice and so forth, to eliminate a bunch of people that apparently uh, in, in Tibet at some point they were hot on somebody, or everybody was hot on them. And 
You know, he, the, the dice, it's wild to think that you throw dice <laughs> to decide these matters. Uh, and it came out wrong. Yeah. And there were a couple others who eliminated that way. And then with the final person, he got uh, good, you know, two throws or whatever, and then the golden urn went well. And, uh, but then what other supernormal means are consulted are not necessarily told. In the case of his own identification, they went to a lake and saw, you know, um, you know, you can call it a collective hallucination of, of, uh, of the village and monastery near where he was born, plus three letters that people, you know, <laughs> it takes time. Agama, Ah, they eventually figured out was Amdo, the province. Ga is for Kumbum, the monastery near where he was born. And Ma, a lot of people still don't know what it meant, but apparently he himself has said that he was called uh, Hamo, Hamo Tundru, the goddess Siddhartha, when he was born. It was his sort of childhood name. And that Ma being mother, female, Mo is female. Uh, that's the meaning that he himself may have. Uh, but of course, if somebody is so highly enlightened as what you're talking about, they can stand there and tell you who they are. They don't need some government to recognize them, right? So, I mean, do they have this three characteristics from their born, or? Well, they should. They should. I mean, if it's somebody that high. Yeah. But if it's somebody who's at this lower end, of who's being, whose rebirth is impelled by love and compassion, not necessarily all three. Because what is the measure of having the altruistic sense to enlightenment is that you've brought the practice of love, compassion, and so forth to the point where <coughs> intensely the mind is always involved in this, subliminally or actively. It's always there. So if, if the tulku could be, could, could reincarnate 10 years before or whatever, as you were saying, so could they be their own student and teacher? <laughs> I guess so, why not? What I think must be most amusing is for somebody like the Dalai Lama to have such a close relationship with his teacher. Now, his teacher has died, and now it's, I don't know, it's at least 10, 15 years. And, you know, he gives the vows to, to what is really his father, who's a little kid. And, uh, this must be quite unusual. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't quite follow. Maybe you said that how the correct view of emptiness entails the altruistic intention. Doesn't. It doesn't, OK. Because so you can have a correct view of emptiness and not the altruistic intention? Yes. And what's that? Is that a great person? Or? No. No. <laughs> the person is still on the middling level. Okay. That's the correct view of emptiness. You couldn't, could you have the correct view of emptiness without having thought definitely of God of sickly existence? That's a question. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, could you be the small, the small, and <laughs> realized emptiness? Yes. There are a lot of scholars who think they have, <laughs> who show many signs of being the small of the small. <laughs> No, because you see, emptiness is too profound, too profound. To be, if you can't understand suffering, how could you possibly understand anything as profound as emptiness? Yes? The question being, in my mind, does the understanding of suffering require the longing to escape? If you, if you were to, the thought definitely to get out of cyclic existence, oh, it would seem to yes. me that number two does in not fact, require number one. In fact, number two, number three, well, let's go back to number three. We were just talking about somebody who, who, in order to develop that last step in the thought to definitely to make the promise to get out of cyclic existence, needs to know emptiness first. So in fact, we ourselves, I'm wrong, we ourselves have positive somebody who has three but not one. 
somebody who has three but is about to have one. Now, in terms of the practice of real, realizing what suffering is and so forth, the person would be well on. Because there's no way that you'll understand emptiness without understanding the depth of suffering. But that person who's a follower of fact needs to know that getting out of civil existence is possible before thought means, thought definitely means promise, before making a promise. Okay? So the same with the altruistic intention to become enlightened. We did posit some people who require knowing that enlightenment is possible before they'll promise to attain enlightenment. But with regard to cyclic existence and knowing that it's a mass of suffering, that certainly has to be done before realizing emptiness. To know the, the three types of suffering that Dalai Lama is talking about. Suffering that, you know, that we always recognize as suffering, mental and physical pain, yeah, sure. And then suffering of change, which means pleasure. The, you know, the pleasures of cyclic existence are all pain. You know, occasionally we have a view of that, right? After you break up with your friend, <laughs> and you look back on it and you say, it's all pain. <laughs> I'm getting very confused now, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so, why would you want to seek the threat of emptiness without the thought to leave physical existence? What, what would be your motivation for studying emptiness? Well, you've been, so it's not that you haven't been trying to develop the thought to leave cyclic existence. You've been studying about suffering, meditating on it, and so forth. You've been hearing about liberation from cyclic existence, but you want to know that it's possible before promising to attain it. Okay? So it doesn't mean that you begin your practice by studying, well, I bet there are people yeah. who yeah. would, you know, uh, through Probably through, you know, whose formal study maybe, or, or through hearing about emptiness, are become open to thinking about, well, there may, there may be a way of getting beyond pain. Because otherwise you think, well, what's the point of concentrating on how much pain there is? Because there isn't anything you can do about it. But to get to the point where you could actually realize it, did you follow? I don't think that's possible without having realized the depths of suffering. This is just so obvious. But not the promise. You can realize the depth yes. of promise. You can hold back on the promise. Realize the depths of suffering. Understand depth of suffering. Understand emptiness, and then make the promise. To yeah, right. That's, right. that's what. Right. That's what some people say. It makes sense to me. But couldn't, our, mm -hmm. couldn't our, our person, our follower of fact, I guess, who just say they just study philosophy, and through their study of philosophy, their own intellectual powers, they came to the correct view of emptiness. That doesn't seem to me to have anything to do with suffering, unless they look at suffering, choose to look at suffering. With that view. But they're living day in and day out. My guess is the best you could possibly do would be get to a level of correct assumption. Just guessing. Mm -hmm. But this is very powerful. Arya Deva says about doubt tending to the <coughs> fact that it, uh, well, the, the metaphor is mixed, but it's, uh, see this. I don't know, it, it uh, wrecks the seeds of cyclic existence, or tears to tatters the seeds of cyclic existence. Seeds aren't torn to tatters. Something like that. This level of doubt, even doubt, is very powerful experience. So the, the realization of emptiness would cause you to just see no point in life. Or to see. Well, Dalai Lama uses words like that, silly, that to be concentrated just on the affairs of this lifetime is silly. Right. Accumulation of money, house, etc. Yes. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, it's 
and there wouldn't be blockage to uh, seeing the nature of your own body. Right. So, so then, then it, I can never see how it would lead into suffering. Yeah, you have to understand cause and effect. Um, I'm noticing that with the first we have the intention to get out. This is a process. And the second we have the intention to attain another process. The third we have correct view. This is no longer a process. This is a status. And um, I'm wondering whether um, as such the third might be integrated or not into the first and second um, according to the individual. Um, and maybe stand as a separate uh, issue in a way, rather than as a gradation in a hierarchy, but rather as something that must be integrated in the first and second. Well, that's what Those we've been saying. Processes. That it is integrated, and it's not in a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy between the first and the second, right? Uh, and you're definitely going to have to have the view of emptiness in order to bring about either of these, getting out of cyclic existence or attaining highest enlightenment. But as you're saying very nicely, this number three gets has ways with followers of the fact that at mini well, at minimum of being involved with the thought definitely got a cyclical existence. Plus in order to bring it about, you need you you need to develop number three. Same number two. So then could we say that the correct view of emptiness was in fact the basis of the path of a great being? No, because the basis of the path of a great being is the altruistic intention to attain enlightenment. Now, let me give you, there are a little bit, one of uh, the Tibetan scholars that I work with said it's really not it, it's at a step just before the altruist nation to become enlightened that you become a being of great capacity. Just before it. As there are seven steps in this process. There's seven steps. And the seventh is this promise to attain enlightenment. The sixth is this is the high intention. If I had to do it alone. I will free everyone from suffering and join everyone with happiness. If I had to do it alone, I would do it alone. Now, nobody has to do it alone, but it's, it's, it's that depth of feeling. And then between the sixth and the seventh is when the person reflects on whether enlightenment is possible. realizes the uh, crystal-like nature of the mind, that defilements don't inhere in the nature of the mind, don't subsist in the nature of the mind. They're immovable. <coughs> the defilements can disappear in the nature of the mind. The Dalai Lama has very nice language on this. So the person realizes that it's necessary to attain enlightenment in order to bring about this high resolve. And then realizes that it's possible to attain enlightenment, and then promises to attain enlightenment. I'm just confusing the, little, the issue a little, but it also gives detail. So it's not the correct view of emptiness is not what distinguishes the great being, because the middling being even though the person can become a being of middling capacity merely through de developing this deep intention to get out of cyclical existence and has not developed the correct view yet, the person must develop the correct view in order to get out of cyclical existence and will not become a being of great capacity merely by doing so. Are you with me? That person has number one, but by Generating number three doesn't become a being of great capacity. Only does it by generating number two. Yes? Where would we put not have that? Would it be a...
where? Tell me. You said middler, right? Yes. Nothing else. An arhat, somebody who has attained the bodhi of a low vehicle, uh, the nirvana of a low vehicle, is a person of middling capacity. So this is a, a map. It's a blueprint, a uh, world view. Yes. So an arhat has a correct view of emptiness? Absolutely. An arhat has, according, now we're speaking from the point of view of the consequent school. Within the middle way school, and according to them, arhats have direct perception of emptiness in its most profound form. But they don't necessarily have altruistic intention. They don't. If they did, they'd be beings of great capacity, and, and then move on. Okay. Uh, well, I, that's not a nice way to say it. Uh, there are arhats who would have this in addition to what they already have. They would still be arhats. Yeah. Well, would they be bodhisattvas at that point? Yes. But uh, I assume that you can be. Oh, well, well, yes. Um, but I don't think you're a bodhisattva arhat. I think I'm a little bit forgetting, but Bodhisattva Arhat is somebody who's attained the eighth Bodhisattva Grand. What is it? An Arhat of the Great Vehicle is a Buddha. Arhat of the Great Vehicle. Now, at the eighth Bodhisattva Grand, I'm talking through my head. The Arhat of the Great Vehicle is a Buddha. There's no question about that. I think I'm just talking through my head on that one. So this person is, are you still an arhat of the low vehicle when you've become a bodhisattva? Right, right. Jeez, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, you I still forget. have that. You you, no question about you, having it. But you come back if you're aroused by the Buddhism in the direction. Just, and it's just back. terminology. Yeah. Then I don't if, remember the ins and outs. If you're an arhat who develops the altruistic intention, you come in at the path of accumulation. Correct. So, she's getting into complicated questions. Um, when you develop the respective motivation, I mean, the motivation of your path, either one or two, you attain the path of accumulation <coughs> of your vehicle, the path called the path of accumulation, whether that's of the low vehicle or of the great vehicle. If it's of the low vehicle, it means you've attained number one. If it's of the great vehicle, it means you've attained number two. Which includes number hmm? one. Which includes number one. So either you have both yeah. or you have only number one. Right. Then the next path is the path of preparation. And this is a stage of preparation for direct realization of emptiness. We'll be talking a lot about this as the course goes on. Now the path of seeing <coughs> happens when you have direct perception of emptiness. You with me on direct perception? That is not, the, the bottom line of the correct view is inference, right? Inference. Once you have that inference, then in time you develop direct perception of emptiness. In order to become an arhat, you must develop direct perception of emptiness. In order to become a Buddha, you must develop direct perception of emptiness. Both vehicles are the same. So, next level is the path of meditation which just, you've done a hell of a lot of meditation even before the path of accumulation. 
but it means that you're re-entering direct perception of emptiness. And then the last is the path of no more learning. Buddhahood, you can see, once you attain Buddhahood, there's no more learning, no more training. You got it. <laughs> You're spontaneously bringing about the welfare of sentient beings throughout all time and all space forever. It's, there's no more training, but you, 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 you remain active. Path of no more learning as an arhat means you've got no more learning to attain an arhat, but you need to go on in order to become a Buddha. <coughs> now what Susan has asked is, here we have somebody who is on the path to becoming an arhat, which means that the person develops the thought definitely to get out of cyclic existence, right? At which point the person attains the path of accumulation of the low vehicle. Before then, or after, <coughs> or after that, gets the correct view of emptiness, and over the path of reparation, works with that correct view of emptiness and develops direct perception of emptiness. Goes on, meditates more, direct perception, and then attains arhatship. Now that person, when she develops the altruist intention to attain enlightenment, enters the great vehicle. Now when you enter the great vehicle, you enter on the level of the path of accumulation, right? Because that's where the motivation part is established. But, but you've already directly cognized emptiness. So this is her question. What are you doing? You can read Jules Levinson's thesis. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Um, you're overcoming, as I remember, what they say is, defilements, which are the assumptions of bad states, So even though you don't newly, ha I'll have to read up on it. Even though you don't newly have to develop direct perception of emptiness, since you've already done it, there are defilements that, um, for instance, one of my uh, original teachers in Mongolian uh, said it was like you're sitting cross-legged and, you know, he's on a chair. And you can't help but <laughs> bop your foot up and down all the time. He happened to do that a lot. <laughs> um, and you might have an arhat. Arhat, a monkey jumps down and goes around like this, and the arhat spontaneously jumps up and goes, you know, uncontrollably. It's like, habits that don't have anything to do with the ideational, and the ideational doesn't mean superficial, structure that makes for afflictive emotions, but that there are like behavior patterns that are embedded in the, in the mind that come out under, unu under unusual circumstances. So your emptiness is not tested. It's, it works in a certain situation, but if you throw it into a situation of stress or something, then it, it, you fall back to habits. Uh, yeah, but it's not like habits of afflictive emotions. Oh, it's not? No, okay. not at all. Because once you're an arhat, you have overcome, overcome all afflictive emotions forever. Forever. It's not that. These are not afflictive emotions. These are behavior quirks twitches in the eye, is it <laughs> under bright light, things like that. And is it because those behavior quirks might interfere with your ability to do, come up, to help all beings? That's probably true, yes. Buddhahood 
is a perfection of mind and body such that uh, it's possible to appear, uh, you can say at will, but really spontaneously, in whatever form is necessary in order to help other beings. There's absolutely no obstruction at all in terms of knowing what should appear to help someone, what form would be helpful, and uh, Well, in terms of knowing other people's situation and in terms of knowing what would help. So Buddhahood, as opposed to our hardship, is complete purity of body and mind. Such it, it's even greater self-perfection than the self-perfection of an arma. But the aim of the self-perfection is to help others. And the only way for that self-perfection to be brought about is through compassion. What is it that somebody the great vehicle has that a person of the low vehicle doesn't? A person of the low vehicle even has direct perception of emptiness. A person of the low vehicle enters into direct perception of emptiness over and over. But the person of the great vehicle has is the altruist intention to attain enlightenment, love and compassion that are increased in uh, it said for a limitless, per limitless period of time, over limitless lives for a limitless period of time. God, sometimes now I'm remembering things in English rather than in Tibetan. Um, and so this is one of the topics we're going to keep, be, keep coming back to. What is it about compassion and the acts of compassion, ethics, patience, generosity, that purifies the ability to appear in whatever form would be helpful for others? Conceptualization based on ah. their, the path that they took case, to be destroyed. Um, before I even get home, I think I just did direct perception. Uh, uh, these people say that it's not inevitable. Direct perception of emptiness does not inevitably lead to to this level of love and compassion. It doesn't mean no love and compassion, but to this level of primarily dedicating yourself to the welfare of others. Um, uh, I myself is, is don't know what to think about it. Yeah. I mean, is there a line being drawn between um, the actual um, the feeling of love and compassion and the, the action that one takes upon that feeling, based on that feeling? Yeah, that's not the line. The line is... Uh, I alone, if I had to do it alone, I'd join everyone. I am willing. I, you know, dedicated myself to joining everyone. I mean, does it have to be in that exact Whereas, what I'm asking is, is oh, I'm sorry. That, that, um, is that position inspired by something that a Buddha would have that an Arhat lacks? Yes. Or is that position inspired by karma or, or just... One. It's something that a Buddha has that an Arhat lacks, but it's something that a Bodhisattva has, which is lower, right? right. And an Arhat right. doesn't. The Arhat has to train to get it. Okay. So it's 
All right.